night, everybody. Welcome to the program. I, like you, was pretty stunned. I didn't expect it. Last I heard from O.J. Simpson, he was tweeting saying, I'll be back on the golf course. That was February. Yes, he was dealing with cancer. Yes, he was dealing with treatment. But he said it, that he was going to be fine. We don't pay a lot of attention to O.J., though, do we? Over the years, I think we've just finally been so disgusted, even those tweets don't land. But today the news landed. O.J. Simpson, dead at 76, and it got me thinking. It got me thinking about what it meant, what it meant for the the Goldmans and the Browns. Fred Goldman told me this morning on the phone, it, it means how long I've been without my son. That's what this death day means. It means 29 years I've been without my son. I also thought about the moments after this famous moment in court, the verdict. I thought about all the things he did after this solemn face in court when he got the gift of a lifetime, not guilty. I thought about all the things he did, became a felon, ended up being raided by the cops, got into a road raid incident, and then just toyed with the media and the public, joking about it all. The one thing he never did, remember? Do you remember what he said he would do? After the acquittal, he said he would spend his entire life finding the killers of Nicole and Ron. That's something he never did. He never ran a campaign. He never had a search party. He never did anything. But he joked constantly on the golf course. And that attitude is embodied in some of the videos we're going to show tonight. Some of the grossest, most disgusting behavior that O.J. Simpson perpetrated after he got the gift of a lifetime, not guilty. And after he got what was coming to him, a civil verdict saying, you did it. You're responsible. 33 million reasons why you're responsible. Cato Kalin is live on this program with me tonight. I have had the delightful opportunity to get to know Cato over the years. And at first, you know, with the circus of the OJ trial, I wasn't sure what to make of him. But in the ensuing years, this is a man who has thought deeply about the life that he has been thrust into because his entire life was upended by O.J. Simpson and this trial. Who would he have been if not for these moments on the stand? What would he have become? How would he be different? He is very contemplative about that. And if you didn't see his tweet today to the victim's family members and O.J.'s children who were victims in this as well, they lost their mother to murder. Um, It was very profound. I'm going to speak to him about all of this. And it's a great interview. Uh, He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to do interviews. But he agreed to do it with me, and I'm very thankful for it. So please stay tuned for that. And then also, if you uh, heard about the whole P. Diddy's woes thing, I don't know if you missed the next chapter, which was P. Diddy's son has been sued. The allegation that he attacked a steward on board a luxury yacht that his dad rented, chartered. First person I thought of was Captain Sandy Yon at Below Deck because that lady has been around the ocean. She is a captain of yachts that most men could not manage. And she has seen a thing or two about charter guest behavior. So I called her up and I asked her if she'd be on the show because I want to ask her about stuff we don't see on TV and how some of those stews and stewardess are really treated when they're just trying to provide the ultimate luxury experience for some very non-luxurious guests. Sandy is coming up in just a moment. I'm a huge fan of hers, too, so I'm super excited about this. But I want to start here. O.J. Simpson did not invent murder. He did not invent sensational trials. But the murders he was charged with, tried for, and acquitted of, they changed my business. More than any other case, they spawned this subcategory of journalism called true crime. And to be very clear, Orenthal James Simpson went to his grave with exactly the same number of murder convictions that you and I have. Zero. I'm also very aware that you've been immersed, or should I say re-immersed, in this man's life and crimes all day long. I know because I've been on News Nation all day and I've been talking about them. And I do not intend to unpack all of this again, but still I am fascinated by the fact that O.J. really had four lifetimes. There was O.J. the football star. There was O.J. the Hollywood star. There was O.J. the man accused of a gruesome double butchering murder. 
And finally, there was O.J., the pitiful ex-con who surrounded himself with hangers-on and ne'er-do-wells. He may have been free as a bird when he died, but to much of this country, he was a pariah, and he was just running out the clock. And it seems that the buzzer just went off. So what is left to say? My team and I have been asking ourselves that question for 12 straight hours now, and we keep coming back to the trial. Not Simpson's only trial, but the trial of the century. Air quotes implied. State of California versus Orenthal James Simpson. The obsession started long before a word was even uttered in this courtroom. It started when America stopped dead in their tracks to watch this, this white Ford Bronco, meandering along the L.A. freeways with two dozen police cars behind it and news helicopters overhead and thousands of people lining the roadways. O.J. Simpson was inside that Bronco as a passenger. And at that point, hours overdue for an agreed-upon date at the LAPD headquarters. That's where he was supposed to be. He was wanted for the stabbing deaths earlier, uh, several days actually earlier, of his beautiful wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, ex-wife at that point, and her young and handsome friend, Ron Goldman. It happened outside of Nicole's condominium. The chase itself really, I guess you could say it ended with a whimper. But the trial... Many of us wondered if that trial was ever going to end. From the opening statements to the verdict, it took most of 1995, almost nine full months. And if you're too young to have watched it live back in the day, you still know the players and the moments that live on today. Can you demonstrate for us how loud it was? Somewhat, yes. Go ahead. Here. Yeah, go ahead. And where did that noise seem to be coming from? From the back of the wall. From behind you, uh, where from, you were sitting? Right, from behind the wall. Detective Furman, uh, was the testimony that you gave at the preliminary hearing in this case completely truthful? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Have you ever falsified a police report? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Is it your intention to assert your Fifth Amendment privilege with respect to all questions that I ask you? Yes. yes. The question is what the evidence that was presented to you that relates to who killed Ron and Nicole, what does that tell you? Does that convince you beyond a reasonable doubt? No matter how much more qualified or how much better they could have done their job, still in all, did they present enough evidence to you? Did the evidence come to you in sufficient quantity and convincing force to convince you that the defendant committed these murders beyond a reasonable doubt? Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that we have more than met our burden in this case. Like the defining moment in this trial, the day Mr. Darden asked Mr. Simpson to try on those gloves and the gloves didn't fit, remember these words, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And the verdict? More than 150 million people tuned in to hear two words that shocked and outraged many of them and shocked and thrilled many others. Not guilty. And those feelings haven't faded much over time, although for some they have. At the head of the outrage camp, and understandably so, the family of Ron Goldman. Earlier today, I spoke with Fred Goldman on the phone. That's Ron's dad, when the news was still fresh and Fred hadn't yet had time to process what it all meant with his daughter, Kim. He was just boarding a flight from Arizona, where he now lives, uh, to Los Angeles. But this is what he told me personally on the phone. He said, the news of OJ dying today does nothing more than underscore the length of time we have been without our son, Ron. This should be a day everyone remembers Ron and Nicole before reflecting on his football history. And then earlier this evening, Ron's sister Kim issued this statement from both her father and from her, and I'll read it verbatim. Uh, she says, the news of Ron's killer passing away is a mixed bag of complicated emotions and reminds us that the journey through grief is not linear. For three decades, we tirelessly pursued justice for Ron and Nicole, and despite a civil judgment and his confession in If I Did It, the book, the hope for true accountability has ended. 
We will continue to advocate for the rights of all victims and survivors, ensuring our voices are heard both within and beyond the courtroom. And despite his death, the mission continues. There's always more to be done. Thank you for keeping our family and most importantly, Ron, in your hearts for the last 30 years. My first guest tonight is a man, um, one of many, who were made famous by the trial of the century. Cato Kalin was O.J. Simpson's house guest on the night of the murders and a key prosecution witness. Today, he issued the following video statement. I've been asked to comment on the death of O.J. Simpson. Foremost, I'd like to express my condolences to the children, to Sydney and to Justin, to Jason and Arnell. They lost their father and that is never easy. I wish to express my love and compassion to the Goldmans, to Fred and to Kim. I hope you find closure. And finally, to the family of the beautiful Nicole Brown Simpson. May we always cherish her memories. Nicole was a beacon of of light that burned bright. May we never forget her. And Cato Kalin is kind enough to join me live now in this News Nation exclusive. Cato, it's good to see you again. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the program tonight. Hello. Um, it's such a weird question to say, how are you doing, you know, especially today. But I do want to know how this news hit you this morning. Well, I, you know, uh, listening to your, your monologue, which was so eloquent, and I have to tell you that I'm sitting in this chair, and it, you took me like in a time machine back and honestly so many emotions were just like just brewing inside me and uh and it just it brought me back to 1994 and 95 and as as far as this morning goes i i got up this morning and just saw over 100 messages and immediately i in my head i just said someone died and uh after looking at the news stories i saw that it was oj simpson and i i wasn't going to do any sort of statement and I just had so many, I was inundated with so many things. I said the best thing I could do is to sit down on my own feelings and give it some time and to express what you just, just played on your show. And, uh, and, it's, and it's true. And, I, and you know what? I think you know, of, of the Browns uh, family and uh, uh, Fred and Kim Goldman, and I don't think there, there ever will be closure because of what you said. I mean, there's closure because he's dead, but they, they live it every day. They miss their son, and they, the Browns miss their daughter. It's... Uh, and, and of course, uh, Kim misses her brother, but there's closure, but it goes on forever. There never really will be. They'll miss. They can't be brought back to life. Well, you know what? It was really gracious and eloquent of you to put out that statement that strictly addressed those who um, have been so deeply affected, including OJ's kids, because some people might forget. They lost their mother in a gruesome murder, and they have dealt with the aftermath of what the O.J. image you know, has become, who is the only parent they had left. How have you been able to process? Have you ever had any connection um, to any of these players since the trial? You know, actually, after the trial happened, I, I made a, a sort of an oath to myself. I, didn't, I wanted to move forward because that was that's just really a dark period. And you, you know me somewhat. I'm really about light and laughter. And that part, I, I, I wanted to be past. There's nothing I could do about the past. It's everything I was doing had to be present. I can always work that and make my future better, make future better for, for everybody else. So that's what I, I focused on, and I didn't go past. I mean, I had some messages from Tanya on Facebook, Tanya Brown. Uh, I did Kim's podcast. And uh, um, so those parts I did, it was uh, uh, cathartic for me. But... Everything else I'm doing is just to make things better, not just for myself, for other people that, uh, in my life. And I've lived by the motto since being raised by my beautiful parents in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Large family is always pay it forward and make life better for the next person. And I really, I believe in that. I, I do that every, every moment. You know, it's... Um when we were going over those materials at the beginning of the show, it really does sort of catapult you back, but it's still hard to believe 29 years, right? Like that is just a lifetime. And so many of the people I work with weren't alive for this. I, I really wonder how, right. because, you know, back then we didn't talk about PTSD, right? We just didn't. It wasn't a thing. Now it is. Do you think that you uh, suffered from PTSD? Do you have a place 
in your contemplation today where you have to really address what you went through and, and, and how it completely overturned your life? I, I'll tell you the truth. I'm blessed that I have the best friends in the world, the best family in the world, because when you have that backing, you can, you can conquer anything, and, and they not only keep you humble, but their, their, their word, their guidance, make things A-OK. -okay. You know, uh, actually, you, you think about the trial. It's a, going on 30 years, what happened, and I really believe that it's, it will go on forever, long before I'm, I'm passed, because it's a template of that trial. And everything's going to be compared to that trial. I mean, you had a, a ESPN doing an Oscar-winning documentary. You had a, a show with Ryan Murphy producing that won eight Emmys. And it's all, the, it's all about this trial. And every trial will be compared to that one. And like I said, it's never, it's never going to end. Uh, it'll, it'll go on forever. Uh, but as far as the PTSD, no, no suffering at all. I'm so glad to hear that um, because, you know, the, the, when a horrible crime happens, there, there is a reverberation, a huge ripple effect on so many people, not just those who are close in the family, but others, friends, associates, those who are swept up, were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And there's no more example of that than, than this trial. People had no idea what was coming, yeah. coming their way. And I know that you've said before you believe O.J. was guilty. Um, I think you also said that he would never confess, not even on his deathbed, and that's where we are. So I suppose you're not surprised right. that we've landed on this day this way. Well, I, I believe in God, I believe in heaven, and I sure hope I end up, end up there, uh, even if it's a guest house up there, but I hope I end up in heaven. And I don't know if he had that, that moment of penance where you had that saying in your last moments on your deathbed, but I doubt it. I, I, I don't know. I just think, um, uh, boy, you, you, I would think a person has to make peace with their maker. So I, I'm pretty sure that he kept everything until the day he died, and only he knows. How do you think O.J. Simpson will be remembered, given the extraordinary fissure in society, mostly along racial lines when the verdict came down, and then the 29 years since, and all the behaviors we've seen him right. display. Well, what you're, the point you're, you're saying is uh, uh, terrific, because, because of the symptom trial of the verdict, we had split screens of white and black reactions, and we all saw it. It was played over and over on TV's 150 million people, and it was repetition, and that just brought us so far back as a society. And we've never recovered. And then we had the George Floyd situation, and it got even worse, and it's on that way. And I live in L.A., and I gotta tell you, <laughs> L.A., crime is accepted. You can shoplift up to $850 and not be arrested. And if it's acceptable to have crime, there's going to be more and more criminals. And it'll, actually, it'll never be fixed, and we're going to continue to be backward as a society. And I, I really believe that split screen, everything, made society worse for what it is today. Listen, I um, can't thank you enough for um, deciding to, to do this interview. I, if our audience doesn't know this, it was really hard to book you, um, even though we've become friendly you didn't you didn't want to do tv interviews you just you weren't interested in that kind of thing and so i'm very thankful that you chose us to do this cato thank you and and god bless you as you progress in the rest of your life i i i really appreciate it from my heart and thank you all and uh, uh remember the whole it's really about two young people that lost lost their lives yeah no kidding um hard to believe 29 years ago cato thank you again wow thank you ashley you know, um, amazingly, almost everybody in the O.J. Simpson murder trial became a household name. The unknowns became famous, and the already famous became extremely famous. And that includes my colleague, Geraldo Rivera. There are few journalists who matched his dogged coverage of the trial and its aftermath. Um, we're going to have that in just a moment, and also... O.J. in his own words, and some words you would not believe he would utter after this verdict. It's all next. The verdict in O.J. Simpson's murder trial was one of the most shocking moments in TV history. Scratch that. History.
plain old history, um, but it was also one of the most polarizing. It absolutely divided the country, and there's no better evidence of that than the reaction of Oprah Winfrey's live studio audience. Take a look. In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211, we, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. Superior Court of the State of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the State of California versus Orenthal James Simpson. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Ronald Lyle Goldman, a human being, as charged in count two of the information. That's so telling. Oprah standing there just bewildered. Simpson's jury was overwhelmingly African-American, and for years, those who had wanted a conviction wondered whether the acquittal from that jury was some kind of payback for the Rodney King beating and the acquittal of the four LAPD officers who did it. Two years earlier, those not guilty verdicts for the officers, that's what sparked the L.A. riots. And the payback theory in O.J.'s verdict, that was largely confirmed. In 2016, when one of the Simpson jurors said this in an ESPN documentary. Do you think that there are members of the jury that voted to acquit OJ because of Rodney King? Yes. You do? Yes. How many of you think felt that way? Oh, probably 90% of us. 90%? Did you feel that way? Yes. That was payback. Uh huh. You think that's right? And that's your answer. Earlier today, News Nation's correspondent at large, Geraldo Rivera, discussed the racial undertones of the OJ case on social media. And this is what he wrote. Very interesting. Simpson exploited our nation's racial divide to avoid being found guilty of the brutal slasher killings he perpetrated on Nicole Brown Simpson, his children's mother, and her friend Ron Goldman. The diametrically opposed reaction in real time of the elated black community and the outraged white community to the verdict spoke more potently about America's racial divide than any thoughtful essay ever could. And Geraldo Rivera joins me live now. Geraldo, you and I talk about so many crimes of the day, and and here we are, both of us having digested this one for the last three decades. You also wrote, even videotape of the murders would not have been enough to convict popular black football and Teflon media hero O.J. Simpson. Do you think that this was truly the payback that that juror uh, Carrie Bess said 90% of her fellow panelists felt. I am not surprised. I think that it was a, a very profoundly moving and telling statement from the former juror. I absolutely agree with it. It's, uh, it's something that you sense. It was, it was really choosing up sides, uh, whether it was in a university or, uh, you know, in a business or a man on the street, even in prisons, everywhere, there was cheering and, and, and tears. It was a horribly, profoundly divisive verdict, a moment in time, a moment in history. It was a reaction to Rodney King. It was a reaction to a lot of uh, bitterness, a lot of uh, incidents that have happened over the decades, the long generations of our existence as a nation. It's, uh, it's so uh, uh, telling and depressing uh, because it is real and it haunts us, Ashley, uh, to this very day. It does. And I, um, I was watching my colleague and our colleague, Dan Abrams, a little bit earlier. And I want to play something that he also highlighted. And that was O.J.'s behavior after he got the gift of a lifetime, the not guilty verdict. The things that he said and the things that he did, it's more outrageous than I even remember, including the mock stabbing of a reporter as a joke, I want to roll that tape, Geraldo, and then I want to ask you if you think his behavior really mitigated the support that he had in the black community in the decades after the trial. Let's roll the tape. 
if you promise that you will not ask me another question about the case. I will never ask you again. We won't have to talk about it anymore. Just did you do it? <laughs> no, I didn't. Nope. Did not do it. After we finished filming, O.J. said to me that uh, he had a surprise for me, and I genuinely was surprised. I think it was his idea of a joke. And this is it. The person who's made the most money, the most money, and they have improved their lifestyle the most out of Nicole's death is Denise Brown. She ain't on welfare Excuse anymore. Me. Excuse She's got a job me. now. That's I have all I always got to had say. a job. Good night. Tune in. Hey, Denise, I'll put up all of my credit cards. I'll put up all of my charitable work. I'll show them all my IRS statements before Nicole's murder. You do the same. I challenge you to do the same. I want to Let's get... see who's benefited. You and I, we didn't get along. We didn't get along because you couldn't control me. That's oh, why that, we don't I didn't get, get along because Nicole was afraid you were going to have sex with me. Oh, That's please. why we didn't get along. It was Nicole that told oh, me to Oh, please, stay your away ego is just really riding a little bit too high, Simpson. The truly righteous are not the self-righteous. Just remember that. I read that in the Korean. OJ, I want to say I don't like you. I can't stand you. I want to call you names. I want to throw you right out of here. But you know what? Your husband's watching. You better watch this. He's done it to me. So, you know, there's there he is, right, uh, pretending to stab a reporter, um, going after his former ex-wife's, you know, his former sister-in-law, and then um, suggesting that Wendy Williams, you know, you know, ha- had the googly eyes for him. Um, do you think that had an effect on how the polarization of the racial community on that verdict ended up being 30 years later? I, he certainly exacerbated uh, an existing problem. O.J. Simpson was a murdering punk. He was someone who uh, was disgusting in his behavior. Uh, he, you know, uh, he cared more about golf and him, his own image in the in the mirror than than anything else. You know, this was a a person who took advantage of the racial divide in this country, despite the fact that he was probably the least black man in America. He never hung out with other black people other than staffers like uh, uh, Al, uh, Al Cowlings. Uh, he never went south of the 10 freeway except to revisit USC. Uh, he never, as far as I know, uh, did any, certainly by the time of these, these uh, brutal homicides, did anything to further uh, the, uh, the plight of black people in this country. He's, uh, you know, uh, mm. uh, someone who... I have total disdain, disgust, really, for. Uh, you know, he, he rode his, uh, his celebrity at, 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 on the football field with the, the Bills and SC and Naked Gun and, uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, he had a, a, a charm. There's, uh, there's no doubt a malignant charm, just like many, uh, uh, you know, Nazi leaders and, and uh, Charles Manson. Uh, but he, I, I saw through him... Early on, uh, talking to the principals, you know. feeling their pain, remembering the domestic violence I- incidents involving him when Nicole calls 911 uh, after he had this obsession and was intruding on her life. Uh, I, I, he's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Uh, you know, the, this is a yeah. serial domestic violence abuser who is obsessive, obsessively jealous uh, and, and acted out. I think he was so clever that he would book the flight to Chicago for the Hertz meeting, uh, you know, uh, make sure he had a getaway. Right. It was, uh, he's someone that uh, is, is a nightmare. I, I hadn't thought about him in a long time, and I hopefully will not going forward, Ashley. Geraldo, I'm always appreciative of your time and your expertise. Nobody covered it like you, you did. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Appreciate and as Geraldo says those things, I wonder if his family will autopsy him and if there will be any look towards CTE in OJ's brain. That's a chapter that we can still look ahead to. Um, still to come, what happens on the water stays on the water, right? No, it does not. A new and very serious accusation in the... Uh, it's making the pile of legal problems for Sean Diddy Combs even bigger. And it involves his son and accusations of sexual assault of a steward on board a luxury yacht. 
There is a lot that goes on below deck that flies in the face of fancy on some of those big, big boats. And there's one person who knows more about that than anyone. It's Captain Sandy Yon, star of Below Deck Mediterranean. She's live with me next to talk about all the stuff we don't see on TV. I can't wait. I see a lot of famous people in my line of work, but there are very few I would ask for an autograph. And Captain Sandy is one of them. Uh, Sandy Yon is the star skipper of Below Deck on Bravo. And she's an accomplished helmsman on some of the biggest luxury yachts on the ocean today. Fun fact, I am the captain of a 30-foot boat. Sandy's yachts are upwards of 200 feet. So, of course, I have always wanted to meet her. I've always wanted to interview her. But I do a show about crime and justice, and crime and yachting don't really intersect until they do. Uh, because last week, news broke of a lawsuit against P. Diddy's son, Christian Combs, who's accused of sexually assaulting a steward aboard a luxury yacht that his famous dad chartered. There is a whole other side in working below deck, especially when overzealous charter guests start knocking back the drinks the yachties who serve them try really hard to cater to their every need, but their every need can sometimes really cross the line. Just take a peek at this clip from Below Deck Mediterranean, and you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm not messing with her. Okay. So, may I, may I suggest... Listen, wah, 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 Going. You're done. I'm going to have to ask you very nicely. Thank you. Thank you. Loser. Come, let's go. Uh, Ma'am, please escort you to your boat. So, I'm not arrested. No. Take work out of it. The second a man is physical with a woman, that's it for me. Hey, I'm sinking your boat tomorrow. Don't. Stop it. Mm, Captain Sandy Yon knows a thing or two about what to do when things get out of control when you're way out at sea. And she joins me now live. Hello. I'm so glad to finally meet you. Yes, you too. Thank you for having me. So listen, um, it's really interesting when you see a story like the, the P. Diddy's son lawsuit. Uh, it got me to thinking about all the things that some of these charter guests do, especially after drinking, and then how you handle it. Because I know your job is to make an amazing experience for them, but at the same time, sometimes they feel real entitled to the point of committing crimes. I wanted to get your take. So the clip you just played, that was obviously you have really strong crew on board, so you make sure you can correct those people and get them off the boat. On the other side is the captain's job, primary job is the safety of the crew and the guests. And in any case that I feel like my crew are threatened, immediately we could end the charter, head back to the dock and call the local authorities. Now, there's always an investigation that's done, but in my career, that's never happened. Um, that I know of. So it happens. Uh, usually it's between crew and crew, not so much guests and crew. So I really don't know those facts. But for me, it's like I have my crews back. I am the f first line of defense for my crew. Um, and I protect them. And that's our jobs. So as the top cop, you know, on board, the captain really is the, the commander in chief of the vessel. I often wonder what happens if something goes like sideways to a point where the authorities haven't yet been able to get to you. You haven't yet been able to get uh, to to the dock. What do you do? Like, is there some kind of like restraint system that they have on board an aircraft? Like. Good Lord, I can't imagine you wrestling someone to the ground and like putting the zip ties on them. <laughs> yes, that is not our jobs. We just throw them overboard. Uh, just kidding. Um, actually, <laughs> uh, we haven't really <laughs> we haven't experienced that. Uh, you did see that one clip on Below Deck. That was rare. Uh, most clients are really respectful of the crew. Uh, you know, there's a lot of guests that are blacklisted. So captains talk to each other and brokers talk to each other. So there's a lot of celebrities that we do not charter to because they trash the boat, they're rude to the crew, and they're blacklisted. So it's hard for them to charter a boat. So, of course, I'm going to ask you which ones. Oh, well, I can't say that. You know, I sign a contract <laughs> and, you know, I, I do honor that. Uh, but in my, in, 
As me as a captain, I've never, I have called uh, two brokers on two clients, different occasions, and said, get your client under control or I'm putting them on the dock and I'm ending their charter. That means that we keep all their cash and they just forfeited their contract because there is a, a responsibility on their end as well. Um, you know, no drugs are allowed. When they ask you, can we bring drugs on board? It's like, of course not, you know, so... Um, you sometimes in the charter when they have the drugs on board. But as far as violence you know, or uh, on my uh, vessel, I've never had that. Most clients are very respectful. You're lucky. Um, you know, when I read some of the details in the complaint against um, P. Diddy's son and sort of the, the, the mayhem that was ensuing allegedly on that yacht charter, I did wonder if maybe the word would get around. If lawsuits are, are, are filed, is that also something you guys would do? For instance, you'd see, yikes, maybe we better keep P. Diddy and his family off the boats for a while. I think that'll probably happen. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know all the details. I wasn't there. Uh, but I tell you, you know, sometimes when you hear it, you go, ooh, is it really true or not? And um, I, I, like I said, I am the first line of defense for my crew. I believe my crew before I believe anyone. And, um, you know, I wasn't there, so I don't know. And no matter what, it, people need to respect people in their positions. Crew are there to serve. And, and they enjoy serving the clients. It's not, there's, you know, when you take it to that next level, it's not okay. And um, our industry is very protective. You know, we deal with a lot of billionaires, and they own these vessels, and they care about their crew as well. So when they hear about this, that infuriates them, and they start talking to their friends, which also own yachts, and next thing you know, those clients are blacklisted. So we're a very tight community. We care about each other, and we, we're there to serve and do our jobs, but we also demand that respect as well. Yeah, you're not there to serve beyond the line. That, that's for sure. Um, my dream is to have that's you right. on board my boat at some point. Don't laugh at me. It's 30 feet. But, you know, yeah. I, I do what I can. <laughs> Sandy, it's good to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's hopefully not the last time. My, uh, my absolute girl crush right there, Captain Sandy Yon from Below Deck. Okay, still to come. Was it murder, self-defense, or was it something else entirely? We've got the verdict in the Apple River stabbing trial, and it is not the one that most of you picked in our online poll last night. The stunning courtroom moment is next. That he needed. My favorite part about having it delivered, it's convenient, it's there when I need it. It's different than any litter I've ever seen or used, which is why I love it. So give it a try. Visit prettylitter.com today. If you are on trial for murder and you want to show remorse, maybe do it when the jury can see it. Nikolai Mew showed plenty of remorse, but only after the jury left the room, and it may have cost him dearly. The Minnesota man who tangled with a group of much younger people on the Apple River in Wisconsin did not get the verdict that he was hoping for today. I'm going to play it for you in just a second, but you'll remember Mew swore that he acted in self-defense when he pulled out that knife and he stabbed five people, one of them who died back in the summer of 2022. He'd been surrounded by 13 aggressive, drunk teenagers and 20-somethings, and he said he thought they were going to drown him. But the prosecutor said he was just angry. He wasn't scared, and he gutted his victims. Before the verdict, the jurors filed into the courtroom to watch the video of the incident one last time, and Mew, for the first time, showed some emotion. But only after they filed out of the room. Watch. Is there anything else for the record while we're assembled? No. All right, that's all. We are in recess. You saw it. He was wiping his eyes in tears, but the jury was gone. Later, the panel did come back, and then they said this. The verdicts read as follows. As to count one of the information, Isaac Schumann, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first-degree reckless homicide as submitted. Question, did Mr. Mew commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. As to count two of the information, Alexander Martin, the jury finds Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety. Mew was convicted of one count 
first degree reckless homicide and four counts of recklessly endangering safety. And he was also convicted of a count of battery. But it could have been much worse. He was originally charged with intentional homicide and attempted intentional homicide. I am joined now by Dave Ehrenberg. He's the state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida. I couldn't wait to get your take on this because we've been debating back and forth, you know, whether he was going to get off or not. I thought it was all about the ages of the jurors, but most of them were over 50. One of them was even 90. So break it down for me. Reckless as opposed to the intentional. What does that really mean for him when it comes to you know, prison time? Well, the intentional would have given him life in prison. The reckless charge that he was convicted of can get him up to 60 years. So essentially, it's the same thing. But when it comes to intentional uh, premeditated murder, which is the highest charge he was charged with, you have to think he was going in there looking to kill someone or at least had a decision in his mind that he wanted to kill them at some point before he started stabbing. What the jury convicted him of was being so reckless here where he maybe he thought he needed to defend himself, but you don't need to stab everyone around you and then stab them from the bottom up where you gut them, where you where you disembowel one of them, where you stab a person who's trying to break up the fight and you go after him twice after he tries to re- tries to get away from you and including going after Riley Madison, a five foot five, 115 pound young woman like she put you in reasonable fear of your life. So his actions, even if he felt threatened, were reckless to the extent of getting this serious so, charge and conviction. I only have like 30 seconds left, but I got to know this because I think Wisconsin gives judges a lot of discretion in sentencing. What, what are the, what's the reality for this guy on the bench? I don't think he's going to get the full 60 years, but look, he's 55 years old, not 54. He gets 30 years. That's that's it for him. So uh, perhaps he'll get out before he dies in prison. I think that's a real possibility, but he's going away for a long time. Dave Ehrenberg, thank you. Always appreciate it. Really appreciate you being on tonight. Look forward to the next time. Thank you, Ashley. All right, that is all the time I have for tonight. Thank you so much for uh, for being with us tonight. But guess what? Normally at this time, I say uh, that stay tuned because Chris Cuomo is coming up next. Tonight, he is not. Tonight, Geraldo is sitting in for Chris Cuomo, and he has a fascinating conversation about the OJ case. It's all coming up next, so make sure you don't go anywhere, and I'll see you here tomorrow. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson.